then when their item is over everyone should be muted and if you're asked to speak you unmute yourself speak and mute yourself again when you're finished if you have a question press the virtual hand on the screen and the chair will invite you to speak one person at a time if you have a comment to make you should only raise the symbol of a hand when the chair asks for comments and again you will be invited to speak one person at a time if for any reason members cause to leave the meeting they must indicate this to the chair please raise your hand Whilst votes aren't required at every scrutiny, case all is clear, you're not allowed to vote if you've not heard the full de debate. If your screen freezes, but you've heard the whole debate, you may use your discretion. And for attendees in the chamber, if you wish to ask a question or make a comment, when invited by the chair, please press your microphone, which will turn green, and the chair will invite you to speak one at a time. Please wait until your microphone is turned red before beginning. OK. So it's 4 p.m. Everybody online, if you can mute your microphones and if I could ask Democratic Services to begin recording, please. Thank you. Pranam Dar, good afternoon. Welcome to Social Services Scrutiny on Tuesday, the 13th of June 2023. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and may be broadcast via the authority's internet site. The images and sound recording may also be used for training purposes within the authority. Moving on to the agenda. Um, item one, apologies for absence. Um, we've received apologies from Councillor Gareth Richards um, and Cabinet Member for Social Services, uh, Julia Jenkins. And I believe Lisa Curtis-Jones, if she can attend, she will. OK, great. Um, agenda item two, declarations of interest. Do any members or officers have any interest to declare? No? OK. Item three, the forward work programme. So this is the draft forward work programme for our next cycle. So we held a meeting on the 17th of May um, just to draft this and the feedback um, for this we used from the self-evaluation workshop as well and there were some thin things which um, I ticked over from last year, you know, like the NHS goals and things. So we've set it out um, and obviously the purpose of today is just for us to agree the item set out in the forward work programme. So looking at it, um, we've got, right, that's today. So we've got um, some standard items which we had last year, like um, compliments and complaints and um, like the financial update. But today is just to agree the draft. Obviously, we all know it's... Um, it's not set in stone, it's a fluid document and we can add things as well. Um, but obviously it's just to make sure that, the, and just to reiterate that the topics that we've identified are just to make sure that we have a clear scrutiny focus um, and that we are adding value. Um, so yeah, so if it, does anybody have any questions on the draft forward work programme? That's, well, the items that are listed on there so far. No? Any comments on it? No, lovely. OK, then. So we, we'll agree that for now. But like I said, there may be some things that we'll just need to work around and add in if we have any referrals. And again, if there's anything that comes up um, as part of casework, um, and we can just bring it forward then for discussion. Right, lovely. And we're all happy to implement that. So we'll move on to agenda item four then. So agenda item four is the safeguarding overview and the report recommendations for this are for scrutiny committee is asked to receive this report and to raise questions and challenge leading to improvement. Um, so I would imagine that this is going to be both of you, Taryn and Angela. Yeah. So which one is going? Who's going first? Lovely. Yeah. OK, hand you over to Taryn then. Thank you. Thank you. So in terms of today's report is to inform scrutiny committee of how the local authority discharges its safeguarding duties and any themes and changes in safeguarding demand. You'll note the first section of the report outlines how safeguarding children, young people and adults is a whole council priority and the relevant legislation for local authorities in regards to the safeguarding duties. It also outlines our duties in terms of professional concerns and highlights that we are a core member of Comtaf Maganog Safeguarding Board. Um, and that's hence why Lisa can't be with us today because she is the chair of that board that is currently sitting this afternoon. 
It also gives us some overview of the multi-agency safeguarding hub or MASH arrangements, which is for multi-agency professionals sitting at the MASH and when referrals are received and they are screened and supported by multi-agency practitioners. The report then gives an overview of where we were in terms of how MASH looked and how our multi-agency working was during the COVID period and just following and gives some information in terms of referral rates prior to the pandemic period. The report then moves on to give some details and context about the level of safeguarding referrals in both adults and children's services and where the demand for those referrals is coming from and some information in terms of themes and outcomes of assessments. It then moves on just to help outline what our child protection rates look like in Merthyr that have been relatively steady over the last two years following a peak in March 2020 and looks at the general level of screening and compliance with the all wheel safeguarding procedures. We then outline where we want to be in terms of continuing to support vulnerable adults and children within the local authority and we outline next steps in terms of adult services and undertaking a review of their multi-agency arrangements for MASH and what that might look like in the future in terms of resilience and enhanced working and children's services outline the support and change action plan which is to support safeguarding concerns that sits under the children's services strategy. So I know members will have, have read the report so that's just a brief outline. Thank you, Taryn. Angela, is there anything you wanted to give an overview of before I open up for questions and comments? Oh, I think Taryn's covered everything. Thank you very much. OK, lovely. Thank you, Angela. So opening up for questions then, please. Councillor Clive Tubby. Yes, in section 5.3, what we were wondering, uh, you were looking for an alternative to the M-Hub system. What was wrong with the M-Hub system? You know, I, if it's just for collecting data, I couldn't see why it wasn't satisfactory, really, uh, if you've been using it for years. like. Oh, hello, Councillor Tuffy. Um, in response to that, m a number of databases have a, a shelf life and the providers of those databases at a certain point will cease to provide the um, technical support for it to continue. So MHAB is coming to the end of its life, um, I think it's covered in the report, and they've been looking at alternatives to the MHAB system. So what they developed is the GOS system, which is a bespoke system that has been built by RCT specifically to cover off um, sharing of information for all partner agencies. And we're hoping that will come online um, within the next couple of months. Oh, oh, I see. So, oh, it's, it's just like Microsoft has got to be updated every now and again, like, you know, and uh, oh, that's interesting. OK, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Tubby. And any other questions? Councillor Ian Thomas. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, on item 5.2, it says a recent safeguarding board development day questioned the impact of remote working on the efficacy of the team. Um, what were the problems that they outlined in home working? Oh, thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> I think the key issues were is one of the benefits of a co-located team as in the multi-agency safeguarding hub for adults is that they're able to have those more informal discussions and develop relationships between the members of the team. And I think some of the things that we're bringing up were saying that there are an, a number of change in personnel, that they haven't developed the relationships as much as they had previously when they were all working and co-located. So what has been put into place is a hybrid um, arrangement where people are sighted within the hand part of the week and work remotely for the other part. So that was it basically around the relationships between everyone where they're all remote and they didn't have that benefit of developing the relationships as much as they would have should they have been co-located. Thank you, Angela. If you want them now. No, you go ahead, Councillor Thomas. Uh, thanks. 
on the statistics um, that we've got in uh, five six and five seven, um, just comparing some of the stats, it looks as if the highest number of um, reports of safeguarding concerns, uh, which require further action, um, relate to the over seventy fives, and the highest number of alleged abusers are um, professionals. I just wondered if you could elaborate on this a bit and um, what sort of numbers are confirmed. If you um, look great. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, that's okay. I'm just going to say what you do about it. You were just about to tell me. Uh, the other th and in, in line with that, Angela, I'm not sure that I know the exact difference between an allegation and a complaint. Right. Okay, then in terms of professionals, if you look at it, all care homes and service provision is actually monitored by CIW and we undertake a significant amount of safeguarding training with um, staff that work in those areas. So if you look at it, sometimes one one instant could cover a number of professionals. So if it was a medication area, that could have covered five or six individual staff, or it could incorporate the GP or a pharmacist. So that's why I think we have higher numbers of professionals because of the care sector and uh, working with high numbers of vulnerable individuals. In terms of difference between the complaint and an allegation, I'm not sure where that is in here, but what you do get is an allegation is at the beginning of the process where someone will suggest that something's happened, they'll be reported to safeguarding. Safeguarding will undertake a series of investigations to understand that. And then it would not be until the point was proven that you would get um the outcome of the of the investigation. Right. That makes sense. Or oh, I confused him more. Uh, no, no, that's fine. Thank you, Angela. And just okay, thanks. one um, very brief thing, which struck me, where you were breaking down the stats um, into the categories of alleged abusers. Um, I notice you've got one category called other persons. Um, and one category called unknown, and I was just wondering right. who those other persons might be. <clears throat> well, it could be um, someone who's going in and undertaking cleaning um, roles. It could be um, someone who's vulnerable, and it could be a friend that, you know, wouldn't be included as a close friend, but someone taking the opportunity. It could be another service user in some instances, and know those are covered. But, you know, there's a variety of other agencies in there. Not known, it could be, for instance, there had been an allegation of theft, that money has gone missing from a person's home. And that point, they would not know who's actually undertaken the theft. And there could be a variety of agencies going in there, other relatives. So that's why you would be in the unknown category at the point of the allegation. Yes, I can see why they would be in the unknown, Angela. Uh, it's the other persons is puzzling me a little bit because we've got all those other categories that they could slot into. In in all honesty, these are, and I have to admit, I will go and find out from the safeguarding unit examples of what they were put in there, but is there anything that wouldn't fall into those clear categories? Right, thank you, Angela, very much. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Um, Angela, my, my question is in really being sweet on this table, if that's okay, I, I've got a question. I just think, is it a further breakdown, not just of ages? Don't get me wrong, it's alarming that the figure in relation to older residents, you know, with older um, residents is high. Um, so the first question is about that, um, about, you know, is this something that the authority are doing to target that? So that's my first question holistically across the borough, I mean, just like raising awareness. 
But the other one is, is there information available, not just on breakdown of ages, but highlighting protected characteristics, I can't say the word, protected characteristics such as gender, disability, sexuality, because we all know some people are targeted and abused because of those characteristics. And I'm just wondering, are we missing some information here? Because I think there they, they could be other information that we could look at in relation to that. I'll take your first point, um, Councillor Vokes, is the, in terms of the age, you being the higher numbers within the older age groups, if you think of it, they're the higher users of social care services. So you can understand why uh, there's more older people and safeguarding reports on them, but that's because they are one more vulnerable and two higher users of social care services. And I don't believe that they record in the safeguarding team anything specifically around protected characteristics, but I will discuss it with Jo when she comes back. Yeah, I, I think that that would definitely be beneficial for us to have a look at if there is a, a like a breakdown of, of those characteristics, just to just just to see. Um, and then. In relation to the other table, 5.7, so this table, um, this is the number, it says the numbers appear high, but after they fully investigated, the numbers will be less. I just feel we need that table as well, because this is the initial numbers. I think, I, I feel like we're missing a, a big chunk of information there, please. Yes, I'll double check that it's available. We've taken these out of these were the um, only elements of what we'd report to Welsh Government. So I will double check in terms of the outcomes as well. That's proven. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Next, I go, Councillor Declan Salmon. Thank you, Chair. Just in, it's in regards to our children's referrals, and I think we've got two. Um, bear with me now. We've got two at 4.8, it gives the uh, numbers from 1920, 20, 2021, and then uh, lower down it gives uh, more recent dates. Now, to be honest, it's a massive increase over, over the last few years, and obviously, some of that uh, it says is down to the early help hub, which is obviously doing its job because I believe the numbers for children looked after remain remain pretty uh, pretty static within Mercedville. Can I ask, do all local authorities areas have early early help hubs uh, for their areas? Um, and are the numbers for children looked after static throughout Wales or are they different? So in terms of early help hubs in general, lots of local authorities have versions of early help hubs, but not all local authorities have early help hubs, as not all local authorities have MASH systems either. It's about the reconfiguration. I suppose in terms of the information that's before you, we can see there's been an 89% increase in referrals in four years. And I think that's probably a mixed story. That's about post-pandemic need, and we know that there's been an escalation, but also about us trying to drive referrals into that early help hub to get families signposted to help earlier so that they're not escalating into statutory services, which has been successful in terms of the data breakdown that we look at. Further in the report, it shows that even though we've seen such an increase in referrals, particularly last year, we saw almost 2,000 extra referrals into children's services. What we haven't seen is a significant increase in the level of assessments that need to be undertaken, which shows that lots of them are really being worked through that early help hub and signposted up to earlier services. In terms of um, children looked after numbers in Wales, Different local authorities have different patterns. Generally, local authorities have seen an upward trend and Mercer has seen a significant downward trend in our number of looked after children. When we started our current children's services strategy, we had the second highest rate of children looked after in Wales, and we have now in last year's numbers moved down to fourth. So I think that's quite steady and consistent progress for us actually to show overall in Wales that we really are reducing those numbers. It's a fantastic town. You're going to be commended for that. Um, one more question. It's in regards to when the police, um, their rate of referrals has increased uh, by 15 percent. 
the, the, is it a case maybe of that um, the police, uh, the criteria for reporting has changed? So I think, well, I know in speaking to police, they say that actually they're having a higher level of call out, um, particularly for things like antisocial behaviour, for children who are engaging in sending inappropriate images via Snapchat. I think social media has been a real theme and trend from safeguarding perspective and escalated referrals, both from the police and from education provisions as well for us. The police though have recently changed their ways of working as in they are aiming to put in earlier referrals as well. So historically where they would refer just into our multi-agency safeguarding hub, they now refer into both the multi-agency safeguarding hub and into the early help hub and they gain consent when they go out to properties for earlier referrals that we might not have seen. So once again, I think is a mixture, but I think we understand what that mixture is that's seeing that increased rate of referral. Okay, thank you, Tyron. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Sam. And next we have Councillor Claire Jones. We can't hear you, Claire. Claire, we can't hear you. Oh. I just point out that I could hear Councillor Jones earlier on, but she didn't have her headphones on then, so it could be something to do with plugging the headphones might be affecting, and okay, you can yeah. see the mic is going back. Try and plug can in your headphones. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. we can hear you now. Oh, you can hear me now. There we are. Right. Um, Go ahead, Claire. Sorry. Twice call. Hold on, whereby am I? Right, I'm going back to five, five point six again. Um, with the outcome, there, there are no outcomes, so there are quite a lot of of on the table. Five point six with the adult report. The, the, there's quite a lot there, but there's no outcome. So, you know, when you've got 133 cases of neglect, were all them upheld? Um, that's that's my one question, Angela. Um, let me just have a look for my... My other question, Angela, because I don't know whether... You know what it says, we've gone to other, and, you, and I appreciate you gave the explanation. What category does self-neglect come from? Because safeguarding will look at self-neglect. So I'm wondering, does that come under other, or is, is there another category, category again, I'm sorry, for self-neglect? Thanks, Councillor Jones. These are the figures that are reported to Welsh Government, so we've taken them out of the report for last year. Um, yeah. In terms of outcomes, there is no requirement for t for us to report the outcomes, but we are working on that locally to see, you know, the so what question. So we've got all these reports on neglect. It's a piece of work we're currently undertaking as part of the um, quality assurance work for adults to try and capture the outcomes and the so what question. So if we have these, these are the reportable, this is reportable information. So we are looking to extend that, but I will speak to Joe to see if they're currently capturing it in any other area of the quality assurance. I don't believe that they are because it isn't, it's, recorded on an individual basis in WCCS, but not necessarily drawn together as a complete report. Self-neglect is probably quite recent in terms of um, an area of um, adult safeguarding, with last year only, <coughs> only agreeing a self-neglect policy um, for the region last year. So, I'll double check with Joe because I don't believe we've had any through the self neglect panel to date. Okay. So I wouldn't assume that there's many uh, self neglect and including in that other. Okay. Okay. But would it would it come under other though, Angela? Um, it probably would, but I don't believe there's any in there at the moment. Okay. 
the panel has been set up and so far I don't think we've had any discussion on self-neglect through that panel okay. as yet. Okay. Um I've got one I've got one more. Um and that's to do with five point one seven Taryn. Um it, it speaks about the child protection conferences. Uh, I was just wondering, is saying that the new facilitation format will launch on the 1st of July 2023. I mean, that is next month. Is everything underway for that to still carry on and take place, please? Yeah, so planning has gone really well in terms of that relaunch. We've done lunch and learn sessions with fellow professionals so that they feel com comfortable in conference. Families who are currently on the register have had a letter and been offered to meet with us so that they can understand what to expect in our next conference. But I feel very confident that the revised conference model will support families and has been done with families and professionals feedback at the heart of us delivering conferences differently. Well, I for one welcome welcome the change and, and I wish everyone taking part in it all the best because it isn't a very easy um, thing for anyone to go through, let alone a family as well. So, you know, a change is as good as anything and I welcome to see an update. I know that's 2024, but uh, it would be interesting if we can update in the, in the interim to see how it is going, some of the feedback. So well done. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Um, yeah, that would be good. Obviously, when you do that, well, you're not going to be here. When that review is done, that's something we can keep an eye on. Angela, going back to what you said in relation to not reporting outcomes, but that's something perhaps is going to be looked at like through a Mercer lens locally. Um, and you said that's a piece of work you're going to be doing as part of quality assurance. Is it a time frame on that? Because cause I feel... <coughs> Absolutely, we, we do need that information because if we see the numbers and that's it for me, I don't know if everybody else here agrees that we need to see that journey. Like this is the initial amount of referrals. This is the outcome. Yeah. This is the number now, um, because all we see at the minute is the initial numbers. And I, I, I feel like we need a bit more. And I totally agree with that position. Yeah. And there's something we've been in discussion with Joe around. Well, and John previously is to try and capture that information. It is recorded in as much as it's recorded on the individual strat meetings and the closing down the safeguarding report. While it hasn't been built into WCCS in the reportable way so that we can draw out to those. Because what we're trying to do is look from the point, these include PPNs as well, which yeah. are the police notifications. So what we're trying to do is say, these are the alerts, how many drop out at that initial triage from the PPNs, how many then progressed to an A1, how many then progressed to a strap discussion, which is basically when we say in the Dimash, that those professionals have a conversation to make that determination. How many then progress to a strat um, meeting where you bring all the professionals together in a more formal um, position? And then Bob's outcome of that um, investigation. Yeah, so, so we're trying to capture it all the way through. So, so have you got like a time frame of when you're going to be looking at that? Um, we're currently looking at it at the moment, but what we undertaken at the moment, if you look at further in the report, with John leaving, we've also been looking at how best we deliver the safeguarding um, arrangements for adults as well. So it's all tied up into one piece of work. Right, OK. So we put hopefully come back by around September, October. OK, lovely. Thank you. And th my last question was in relation to that. Is that what you're referring to in 7.1? Because it says adult services will complete the options appraisal around future management. Is that is that is that what that is there? Because I wasn't quite sure what that sentence meant. Ah, <laughs> oh, right. With John leaving, we thought it was an opportune time to look at how safeguarding, adult safeguarding is actually managed and delivered. We come up with three basic options, um, which is continue as we were and recruit in the same way uh, as we did with John's post that covered children's and adults. The other alternative was to look at developing 
like a management structure totally within adult services for safeguarding. And then the third option was to look at a regional approach to look at a um, joint MERS and RCT safeguarding multi agency for adults. So at this point, one of the things we really needed to do before we progressed there is cleanse some of that data and dig um, in underneath. Just as you were saying now, what we've been looking at is how many caseloads those safeguarding practitioners have, um, what are the outcomes, how we record and things, and how much of them uh, progress into a strat, how many are progress into one, two, six inquiries, and then Sarah's um, done quite a lot of work on it to, to date. Um, and then we'll utilise that to inform how we progress. So there is work ongoing at the moment um, and George's covering um, the safeguarding elements for adults as well at the moment. OK, so is it fair to say then perhaps the end of the towards the end of the year, maybe we could have a bit of an update where you, where you are with that then? Yeah, we'll bring it back at the end of the year. Yeah. OK, lovely. Yeah. Thanks, Angela. Thanks. Any other questions? Any comments? Comments? Oh, Councillor Declan Salmon. It's for social services, to be honest. You know, the, with the it's obvious with the numbers um, going up between, for for referrals for uh, for, for uh, young people. In the four years, they've gone from uh, nearly four thousand up to uh, nearly seven and a half thousand. It's a lot of extra work. But by keeping the numbers down, it's obviously, you know, which you setting up the early help hub, you've done fantastic work. And to keep our numbers uh, of looked after children down is, you know, it's fantastic. So just thank you to all the team. Fantastic. Thank you, Councillor Salmon. OK, um, no other comments from MDPD? Um, I have one. Um, it's just to acknowledge that this is Taryn's last scrutiny meeting with us. Um, who's leaving the authority. She's worked for Merth Council for 16 years, um, had many roles and progressed in her career in the authority. Um, and as a committee, we just want to wish you good luck and all the best. And thank you. And thank you for everything. And I'd like to echo what Council Salmon said as well. Thank you for everything. I'd just like to say, actually, it's been a privilege to work um, for the community of Merth and for Merth Council. And I feel very lucky to have worked as part of such a committed team. Thank you, Taryn. You set me off now. Oh, thank you. Um, you can leave now if you wanted to. Go and have a cup of Thank you, Angela. You can I stay. Last... All the best, Taryn. Oh, it's been years you haven't made me cry yet, so oh. let's not finish on a bad Oh, Thank you, Taryn. Take care. See you later. I'm just mindful there's another report for self-evaluation as well before Taryn escapes. I uh, know, and uh, that's fine. We're just going to go through that without officers. That's fine. Right, that's okay then. Just wasn't sure if you wanted some questions on that. No, right, no, then. it's fine. Okay, thanks. Right. Bye, George. Take care. Oh, okay. I was emotional. Gosh, you almost had me crying then. Okay, um, agenda item five scrutiny referrals. We have none at this stage. So we, we're on agenda item seven. Oh, God, item six. Sorry, report recommendations. Bear with me. Sorry, Taryn's got me all emotional. OK, uh, item six, report recommendations. So the recommendations for the forward work programme was for us to agree the draft, which we've done. Um, and then item four was the safeguarding overview um, and we were asked to receive the report and challenge leading to improvement. Um, I think for me, I felt perhaps we needed a bit more on that. I don't know what other members feel, um, but it's good to see that uh, the way that, that perhaps that's something they need to go away and have a look at and look at it through a Merthyr lens in relation to outcomes. That That's what jumped out at me. I don't know if anybody else felt the same and I felt that we we offered some good questions there. Are we all have. 
okay. Lovely. Okay, so item seven then is feedback on scrutiny activities. So this is, bear with me, this is the self-evaluation. Um, so I'll quickly read out an the overview of the evaluation. So this allowed members, those who attended, to have a greater understanding of the key issues and the processes undertaken to develop the report. Um, and obviously officers presented three questions to members and to be fair, we did ask lots of questions and we challenged the judgments put forward. Um, and to be fair, there was good evidence offered to support the rationale as well. Um, so we were, we were happy with that. Um, so we noted and supported the overall judgments made within the document. And the key questions were um, outcomes, good provision, good leadership and management was good um, and obviously the, the, the focus of the workshop was to provide critical friend challenge and just to evaluate um, the process um, but yeah I, I feel that it went well and some feedback feedback that we had um, from that some of those items now were populated into the forward work program as well so we carry some of those through um, so yeah, so it is a, a really big document and it is on the appendix. Um, I've read it several times and obviously I went to the workshop um, and it was just the opportunity to see if I had any questions or comments on it. Um, yeah, opening up. Any questions or comments on this agenda item? Really, was that, you know? Uh, Hang on, for you, Mike, on. Oh. Oh yes, it was quite an interesting workshop, really, and we, I fully understand now how, how they go about assessing everything. You know, the, the self evaluation. So I found it very interesting, really. Thank you, Councillor Tevi. Anybody else? Okay, lovely. So that's that agenda item. So agenda item eight is any other business. Um, so I've got two. Um, it's co-opted members I wanted to bring up. Um, I know Jane, we've had a chat about this as well. I'm conscious we had three vacancies last year, um, and obviously we've got them again this year. And I think, like, because I, I, I would imagine we all do sit on other scrutiny committees with the co-opted members, and from my experience, they, they do add value in that different perspective to the scrutiny process, and. Um, I just think that's something perhaps if we have contacts or uh, people, who, you know, people that work in organisations in Merthyr, we can just kind of get that message out as well. And if there are members that want to come forward, even if, and I think our job is to kind of dispel the myth of scrutiny as well, isn't it? Because it can seem a bit formal. And even if somebody wanted to come and have an informal chat with us or even attend a workshop or, or something just to get a flavour of, of what we do. Um, and I think we were going to think about writing out some letters possibly to look at if anybody was interested. Um, yeah, so that's something we'll keep an eye on throughout, throughout this municipal year. Um, and then it's the scrutiny evaluation. Um, so, and I think it's important then to ensure that we are um, adding value. Um, we are going to have some sessions with the LWGA um, next month. There's two sessions booked. There's one for the 10th, which I believe is on Teams, and then the one on the 13th then is face to face. I think team, the Teams meeting is to kind of chat about what we want to work on, and then the 13th is to kind of work on what we raise on, on, from the first session. Um, so if you haven't responded, it'd be great if you could respond to the email just to let um, the guys know if you're attending. Um, so that was it for me. So our next meeting will be the 12th of September. I believe we do have a workshop booked in for July. We haven't actually got a date. We yet. haven't got a date, yeah. Okay. Date, you know, date, yeah. So another date will be sent out. But yeah, um, have a lovely summer. There we are, meeting closed. Thank you all. Thank you. Goodbye.